Good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here to introduce this really beautiful film and to get to speak with you a little bit about one of the most interesting topics, I think, in neuroscience, which is trying to understand how does the brain create the mind and how does the brain create this conscious experience that we all know and share and we all understand. And I think it's a this is a particularly interesting film to illustrate this concept because we all sort of have this intuitive notion of uh, of what being conscious means. You know, you're you're looking around, you can see colors and you can smell and you can hear and you can taste and you can report that you do these things. But it seems to be one of those topics that's really difficult to actually define once you get into it. So what, what is consciousness? Is, a, is your dog conscious because he wags his tail when he sees you? Does that mean he's aware? And is, a, is an artificial intelligence uh, capable of consciousness? These are all the kinds of questions that philosophers and neuroscientists um, kind of uh, loose sleep over and it in this film is really uh, nicely portrayed by this uh, very unusual syndrome that the the protagonist in the film um, is is uh, depicting and so if we can go to the next slide so does anyone have any guesses as to what this brain is doing this is a human brain psyching the thinking sleeping doing something. It turns out that the brain is always doing something. It's always cycling through these patterns of spontaneous activity. There's never a time until the time when you die. There's never a time when your brain stops working. So if you're sleeping or if you're you know, listening or doing complex arithmetic problems, whatever it is, your brain is using a lot of energy to do these processes to keep you alive. The things you don't even think about, breathing and your heart beating, those things are going on all the time. But, and it turns out that when you actually do tax your brain, let's say I ask you to count backwards from a thousand by sevens, that's difficult, but it actually only takes a tiny, tiny fraction of the energy cost of your brain to do that operation. The most energy is actually just used up in this everyday maintenance. Your brain is always using energy. And trying to understand this kind of the nature of spontaneous activity and what it means for levels of consciousness, that's a, a problem that's that we're still working on and is gonna take many more years to get to. It's part of what our lab focuses on and I wanted to share with you some, uh, some things today from the, the neuroscience field that give insight into locked-in syndrome. So if we go to the next slide, uh, this is just an overview of what can happen if you have an acute brain injury. Most of the time people will go into a state of coma, but then what you don't hear about all the time is there's many different ways that that can go. You can get into a vegetative state a chronic coma, which means you, you sort of never arise from that. Brain death, of course. But in this particular film, you'll see an individual who has what's been termed locked-in syndrome. And um, it's a very special case where the, the person is actually aware, but not able to control their muscle movements. So they can't communicate that they're aware. So it's different from a coma where someone is actually not aware of their environment. And basically you can't do anything to, to see that, that they can respond to you. But so locked in syndrome is a very tricky case, as you'll see. And if we go to the next slide, it's a, it's a great sort of uh, about what is it consciousness and what's the nature of it. So we know it's tricky to define. So what scientists have tried to do is break it down into this idea of awareness. So this is what is the content of consciousness. So right now you're aware of sitting in a theater. You're aware of uh, maybe drinking a soda or eating some popcorn. Um, but there's also this level uh, that we refer to as arousal. So this is the level of consciousness. So you may experience this yourself. You might get drowsy. You might be wide awake after uh, having a cup of coffee. These are sort of levels of consciousness that we can uh, distinguish. And if you look at sort of the brain research, that the brain imaging research in particular is trying to understand what happens, um, you know, to mediate these different levels of consciousness. So, um, and I'll just uh, say, oh, well, there's basically the, on the left here, you'll see the brain stem, the sort of lower and more evolutionary older part of the brain is dealing with levels of consciousness, whether you're asleep or awake or drowsy, whereas these top, uh, orange uh, blobs are showing kind of more recently evolved areas that are involved in actual awareness of the external world and awareness of your own thoughts, which we see over here uh, on the right side in blue. So there's uh, you know, different brain systems that we think are important for these different levels of consciousness. And um, you'll see in different patients when they receive injury to parts of the brain, this can affect uh, consciousness in very different ways.
So in the next slide, um, you'll see that this is uh, really, I had to do some research myself to try to understand what's going on in the patient in this movie. And it turns out this patient has this rare case, which is all the way over on the right of the slide called locked in syndrome, where both the arousal and the awareness in the patient are actually quite high. They're actually at the level of a person uh, in this room where we're awake and we're, we're uh, you know, more or less aware of our environment. And that's really tricky though for this patient because he's lost all motor control. So he can't move his arms, he can't tell anyone, uh, he can't, has no control over his vocal cords. So it's trapped, locked in to his body without being able to communicate that he's aware of what's going on around him. Whereas these other people in different levels of conscious, like coma, there's very low arousal and low awareness. So the person is basically non-responsive. And there's all these different levels where you can have, uh, you know, vegetative state is a, another example where you're basically, um, you have high levels of arousal, but low awareness. And you can see there's all these sort of continuum. And even every night we go into a state of sleep where we're, we have, uh, you know, very low arousal, but we do have awareness of dreams, for example. So it's a very complex picture that I wanted to give you a sense for as we go into this really interesting film. And this is just to drive the point home that, as I mentioned, we have our brain always active, always using energy. Um, and if you look on the left, you know, in normal levels of consciousness, the metabolism or the amount of energy we use is quite high. Um, if we go to the next button, you'll see, yeah, it's quite high for normal consciousness. Um, and then if you look at these other cases with altered consciousness, deep sleep, anesthesia, coma, vegetative state, they're all pretty low, around 60 or 70% of energy is used in those states. But in locked in syndrome, look how similar that is to the normal consciousness. The brain is actually metabolizing, using energy at similar levels to what you and I would be using. So this is uh, what makes this such a unique and also horrific syndrome if you happen to find yourself in this state. So um, uh, just to give you an idea, and this is also another sort of brain imaging study where the top row is looking at uh, a particular system we think is important for consciousness in a control or a normal individual. The locked in individual looks very similar to the control individual, if you can see, whereas someone with mi uh, minimal consciousness or vegetative state, they don't show the same activation patterns. So there's something unique about the locked in case that happens after brain injury. And that's because only the lower brainstem areas are affected and not the higher level areas that we use for awareness. So in our lab, we actually um, study how brain networks develop in ways that are related to cognitive maturation in both typical and atypically developing children. So we also look at um, individuals with neurodevelopmental disorders, particularly autism and attention deficit disorder, um, and basically see how these uh, developmental disorders affect the development of, of different types of processes um, throughout the lifespan. And I just want to give you a quick little um, spiel about some of the open questions that I think our uh, lab is interested in and are, are interesting for the field in general, which is how do you know things like traumatic uh, brain injury or brain surgery that are very drastic, how do they affect consciousness? In one particular patient who's had severe epilepsy that we're studying, um, that person had their corpus callosum severed, which is a big um, fiber track that connects the two hemispheres. And we find that we can still find some connectivity in that patient um, using our, our imaging methods. And this person actually behaves as if they haven't had uh, a surgery at all. So they don't seem like their brain is split in half if you talk to them. It's only if you do very subtle tests that you realize, oh, this person actually has two halves of the brain that aren't communicating with each other. So consciousness is very um, sort of resilient to these kinds of uh, even extreme brain surgeries. And if we go to the last slide here, we see that some patients have to have a very drastic operation, which is, uh, again, in the case of epilepsy, sometimes an entire hemisphere, entire half of the brain is removed. And here we often find that the other side of the brain that's, re that's still there is able to pick up functions like language that are usually on the left hemisphere. The other side can sort of recover enough to be able to support language abilities. So we can see that even when you have these sort of drastic cases, the brain can often recover in, in unusual ways that are unexpected. Um, so this is just some of the, the data that we're working on just to give you a feel. And yeah, basically just wanted to end by acknowledging my colleagues and collaborators who are uh, working on a lot of this data, the interesting data I just showed you. And this is my team over at the University of Miami and 
Uh, <laughs> that's the, the machine we use to get those lovely pictures and, and the people who do all the work. I just wanted to mention that I'm happy to stick around after the film if anyone has any other questions and wants to discuss some of the things I've brought up or something that comes up in the film. So thanks a lot and enjoy the movie.